All right, there, I got a sound. Wow. Oh, boy. Well, we'll try this again. We have sound. <laughs> Matt, take a picture of that soundboard. So you know what buttons have to be lit up, please. Thanks, Max. Well, that was a lot of fun. We had to call Max, our technical guy, and it's just a matter of you just keep pushing buttons until it works, eh? Cheers, guys. Maddie, can you take a picture of that soundboard so we know what that's supposed to look like when it's actually working? It's not the soundboard. It's because we restarted the computer. I just flicked those buttons, let it push off, and the sound was still working. Okay. Well. So, yeah. IT 101, restart everything. This is it, eh? So, set up. We've got a notification going on. Everything's great. And then what happens? Couldn't change the camera. We had to change the live stream. And then you know what happens. Oh, my God. We had to restart our computer. My kingdom for a live stream that works like it's supposed to. <laughs> anyway. Uh, well, we made it. We survived. That took us 15 minutes. My God. All right. We're going to have some work to do on the backside of the channel after this is over. Probably have to eliminate a dozen attempts <laughs> the history. Hopefully it doesn't screw up our algorithm. Anyway. Okay, guys. Well, here we are. That was painful. Ah, cheers. Mm. Man. All right. So tonight is um, live stream. We're talking about 13 steps to have a successful renovation. Uh, it's funny because I almost put on the title 13 steps to a successful live stream. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we're here. We're ready to roll. The rules tonight are really simple. Um, we have got everybody available to watch this, but only members can chat. And part of that's because uh, our, our new forum is up and it's been really frustrating to work with. And there's a lot of questions that I've ended up missing. We've made a bunch of tweaks over the last couple of weeks. We had to get past the holiday season and our tech guys have got it set up now so that when you put up a question, it actually shows up in the forum. So, you know, you posted it a, so you don't have to ask three or four times. And when I've read a question, it actually notifies me that I've looked at the question and answered it, which I didn't have before. So I was losing my mind trying to stay on top of everything. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, I bring it on. I'll take it. That was fun. Uh, now, we do have a new mic set up today. We have new sound. We have new audio. We got new upstream. We just uh, it had a glitch getting started. Right? It's like the Black Stallion. Lousy out of the gate, but it runs real fast. So we're going to go through this. I've got uh, like a mini presentation here for you, actually, because this is really good information. And then we are going to jump into your questions and see if we can help save everybody from their impending doom. Right? Because DIY renovations is DIY, which means do it yourself. You don't want to move into the DYI, which is do yourself in. That's, that's, that's something we need to avoid. All right. So um, let's just put on a renovation hat. We are going to have a massive renovation plan in the future. And the first question you've got to ask yourself when you're thinking about the steps to a renovation is you've got to organize your, your horse before your cart. Okay. You got to make sure that you've got everything figured out in the right order because some decisions affect previous decisions that already should have been made, if that makes any sense, right? So you don't want to put your cart in front of the horse and have your horse pushing the cart, the whole renovation. It'll drive you nuts, right? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to jump into this little presentation that I put together because it's spent half the afternoon doing it. And then I'll uh, jump in and join you in the chat and see if we can help you guys out. Um, so the first thing you need with the renovation is you need a vision, all right? You need an inspiration or you need some sort of a, one moment. You got to have a plan, right? You need to know what your end is, what it looks like, whether you find it on Pinterest or um, a TV show or out of a magazine, whatever it is. Because not everybody is visual. Not everybody can just walk into an 1880 farmhouse that's been uninhabited for two years and covered in spiders and go, I see paradise. It doesn't happen. And I understand that. Um, 
my mother had that gift and this is why I can just see something finished. It's not me. It's all her fault. It's genetics. God bless her. But you guys need a vision. So you need an inspiration. You got to find that. And you can get it on YouTube. You can get it off uh, all kinds of places, but have one. Okay. And then you got to take that vision. You got to personalize it. Right. And that takes a little bit of planning. So with that vision in mind, then you got to start working on a budget. Okay. So you can identify whether or not your vision is realistic. I tell this story. We have a, a video on our other channel where we did that bathroom with the really big um, white tiles and the borders, the beige and the black squares and the corners. And it has a walk-in shower and a freestanding tub. It was a beautiful room. But the lady that owned that house came to me with a picture out of a magazine and said, it was the Style at Home magazine. She goes, I want you to build me this. I said, aha, we have a vision. So I went out and I priced out the material list. I called up the, um, the, the people at Style at Home. I got in touch with the designer from that bathroom and I had her send me the material list. And it turned out that the bathroom was going to cost her 65,000 bucks. And she goes, can I get something close, but here's my budget. And so this is what happens, right? You have a vision and you think, I want this until someone tells you how much it's going to cost. And then you got to modify. So good to have a vision. Then you got to modify for your own budget and you got to be realistic. Sometimes you can sacrifice the vision enough that it no longer is the vision anymore. And maybe you need to wait another year or two until you dig in, right? Make sure you get satisfied. You get that because there's nothing worse than ripping out a mediocre kitchen and putting another mediocre kitchen in. That's not a successful renovation. You've got to... You got to grow. You've got to get something better than you had before. Or why'd you waste all the time and energy doing it, right? So first is the vision. From there, we can work out a budget. Budget is simple. If it's a DIY project, it's basically just materials and purchases and appliances, fixtures. You put your list together. You be realistic about it by going shopping, okay? So you don't just say, oh, I think a faucet's 100 bucks. Uh, shower valve, yeah, three-way, well, probably 200 bucks. Don't guess. All right, because <laughs> if you guess, you're going to get it all wrong. And there are different price points that you can work with. So when you're doing your budget, try to do like two side by side, a low end and a high end budget. So that when you're all done pricing it all out, then maybe you can swap here and there, make adjustments and find that happy place. Right. OK. Once we've got a budget, we need to have a plan. We need a permit. Not something I talk about too often on this show because, you know, you're all big boys and girls and you can get a permit if you feel like it. But in a lot of cases, you do need to get a building permit. It's kind of necessary. Um, in some climates, it's not necessary. Like uh, I know Alaska, you don't need building permits. I know that if you wanted to renovate something really quick and you live out in the country and the economy is really good and people are just buying houses sight unseen, you don't need a permit. But in most situations in life, you'll need a permit. <laughs> so feel free, go down and get a permit. And it is as simple as making a phone call. All right. Now, we want to make a, a, a permit and we have never done it before. You contact the local building office. They're more than happy to help, give you the steps, walk you through it, talk you through it, multiple visits if necessary. They, they just they have their own little structure they got to work in. All right. So you got to you got to fit into their funnel. They don't get creative with how to make a permit. They got a funnel and you got to get in there and you've got to be a little less resistant to the system because they have um, responsibilities and rules and codes and licenses and um, uh, all kinds of things they got to protect. So they can't deviate from their system. So it, it can be a little painful sometimes, but it's okay. They're there to help you get through it. They're not your enemy. All right. So as long as you have that in mind, that if you hit that wall of frustration, it's just because it's new to you. It's not because they're trying to be a pain in the butt. All right. Most people that work for the city in the building office are actually quite good with customer service. They've been trained. It, so if you go there knowing you're going to have to mold yourself to their system, you'll be fine. Expectations are part, know, probably 80 to 90% of life. If you know what the expectation is, you can deal with it, right? I always said to my, my friends when I was growing up, said, you know, I don't, I don't care how difficult something is. As long as I know the rules to the game, I'll find a way to master it. So... This is what I'm talking about. Get yourself a permit. Get drawings. Do 3D. Get a, get a designer if you need to, right? Do whatever you need to do to satisfy your need to understand what that space is going to look like when it's finished. 
because you can't start until you can see the finish. I'll say that again. You can't start your project until you know what it looks like finished. You've got to know so that every step along the way, every decision you make is going to be guided by the, the final vision, right? Do, does the tub, is it, is it in line with the tile? Does the tile come out three inches, five inches, one and a half? All these questions, you can't just kind of make it up as you go along. You've got to have a plan because everything you do when you renovate affects the next thing. So if you are prone to needing to have everything in 3D imaging and you got to have it all specced out by NASA mathematicians, then do whatever it is to get done. But don't start until you're confident you're going to get to the finish line. And that is predetermined by the plan. All right. Next thing you got to do in order to have success is figure out how much of this project you're going to DIY or how much you're going to hire out a contractor. Are you going to just get some sub trades like an electrician and a plumber? You're going to get them to do the rough in and you'll do the final. There's questions here. So different places you've got to use different licensed trades for different things. Okay. Um, not everything a licensed trade does needs a permit, but it does need a licensed trade. Okay. So that's important to know. For instance, our gas fire pit. We just did a video on that. My gas guy was able to run the line from the basement underground up to that fire pit and install a huge five foot fire burner. No permit necessary because he's a licensed technician and he followed the rules. It's his reputation on the line. It's amazing to me that he can do that without a permit, but I can't move a P trap in a bathroom without getting a plumber in and get a permit. Figure that one out. But the point is, hey, welcome Sarah to the membership plan. The point is this, <sighs> once you've identified what your budget is and you can figure out which projects you're willing to take on and then you know who you got to contract, you will also be able to have that plan in, in, in fixed and embedded. Now this year, especially, you're going to have to be careful if you're going to go with a mix. If you're going to get trades, call them now. Okay. Get booked, get a commitment, get a contract, put a deposit down, have something in writing that says they're coming to your house, not just a phone call and a promise over the phone. It's going to be tough to get people into the house this year. Okay. It's going to be another year, just like last year. Housing markets will be booming. Materials will be scarce. Supply chains will be messed up. It's going to take a lot of organization this year. And I might even recommend while we're talking about it, scale down your expectations for renovations this year to something simple. Go remodeling. Go a little lighter gauge, right? This is a great year to paint some stuff, do new flooring, and put off a major project till 2021, 2022. Just because of the nature of the environment, right? I mean, politically, there's a lot more stability going on in the world as soon as we get over the next few weeks. It'll be, it'll be nice to at least, you know, know where everybody's heading, right? You may not agree with the direction, but at least we're all going to be heading in the same direction, and that'll help stabilize things. But COVID is still going to be a problem this year, and it's, it is what it is, folks, right? So manage your expectations. You're not going to be able to just run out to the hardware store, depending where you live, and just get what you need and run home again. Like where I am right now, we're in lockdown. I have to order online. It takes two weeks to get anything. It's driving me nuts. So just be really careful that you don't bite off more than you can chew this year, A, in your skill and your budget, but B, in your ability to finish it in the same calendar year. Not a year to be ripping off a roof and changing your roof design. <laughs> you might go to the store and find out they're out of plywood and you're screwed. So just for the, you know, just a heads up warning there. Nothing to do with the talk today, but I like to throw that in. Next step in a successful renovation is to do your demolition. Now, before you do your demolition and part of your planning should include inspecting. If you're going to be ripping things out and it's going to be permanent, like you're going to go open concept, while you're making your plan, take time to cut a hole in the wall and confirm all the electrical and mechanical and things like that, structural point load issues. Identify them all on the wall as part of your plan. Don't make a plan assuming anything. You need to know things before you have a plan, and you won't have what's called unforeseens. Unforeseens means you didn't do your homework. Okay? When I was in contracting, I didn't have unforeseens. I always did my homework and I gave my clients, my price is my price. If I miss something, it's on me. I'm the professional after all. 
You know what I mean? When's the last time you're woken up in the middle of a heart surgery and the doctor said, oh, by the way, we found something peculiar. I can't continue until you agree to give me more money. <laughs> like, <laughs> If he knows his business, he knows his business, right? So if you're hiring a contractor, make sure you've got your plan figured out and they've done due diligence to understand how your house works. Now, demolition. If you have a good plan in play, and you know exactly then from the beginning, when you're doing your demolition, you know what to touch, what not to touch. There are times when you're removing things that if you, if you were to cut three inches outside of a corner so that when you reinstate, it's easier to tape the just a butt joint going to the corner instead of going right through the corner when you're doing your demolition. You'd be surprised an inside corner takes a lot more work than a quick little flat tape joint on the side. Right? It's an extra couple of days. If it's the only taping you're doing, really stop to think about your whole process. How do I save time and money and materials? Why am I using a sledgehammer? I haven't got the water off yet. Should I be cutting the wall in half? I haven't looked and the power's on. All these kinds of questions, right? Be smart, all right? Turn the power off to things, disconnect the plumbing, drain the lines, minimize your risk of having additional damage caused by the demolition. It's one of the most common areas that people make big mistakes. They're doing the demolition and they get that TV attitude and they're just in here swinging sledgehammers like morons. Relax. It's surgery. Uninstall what's there. Take it apart casually. Take your time. Clean as you go. Get your stuff out of your way. Don't make a big mountain of crap in the middle of the floor. It slows you down and it's dangerous. All right. Play safe. Once you've got your demo done, that includes cleaning up. All right. Dirt free, dust free, materials free. I want everything out of that room. You want a clean, empty slate to work with. Okay. Use a shop vac, um, sweeping compounds. You really want to start with a clean house here. All right. In a lot of older homes, especially because there's, there's stuff in the dust that's actually quite dangerous. So get rid of it. All right. And then we're moving on to structure. Okay. Now, from here on in, every time I give you a step, what I'm going to suggest is complete the step before you move to the next step. There's a certain percentage of people out there, like me, that like to move ahead, get ahead of myself. I'll get that later, you know. Always leave something behind and you just keep plowing forward. You really got to discipline yourself to finish a step. So when you go into structure, finish all your structure. Don't say, okay, well, we'll get that corner later. All right. Don't do stuff like that. It makes the whole project actually quite difficult to complete. So if you're going to be touching your structure, finish your structure. If you don't know anything about structure, get a structural engineer into the house. Have them do a walkthrough with you. Explain what's going on so you understand it. You don't have to pay them to do drawings and stuff if you don't want to, but it would be a good idea to have them come out, a couple hundred bucks, spend an hour on the job site, explain to you how your house operates, where the point loads, how your trusses work. Do you need a wall? Do you not need a wall? If I wanted to throw in a beam for extra strength, what's in title of that? Does it have to be steel or wood or can it be a LVL? Get all that information from these people. And then if you feel, wow, I really don't know what I'm doing then pay them a thousand bucks. They'll do drawings. They'll give you a process, all right, so that you can set it up and be successful. Structural engineers need a different title because when you say engineer, the first thing people think is, oh my God, it's going to cost me 10,000. It's just a guy who's been trained to use a stamp who knows the math. That's all. They're not painful. They actually are very cost effective. And in more times than not, they will save you money and save you time and aggravation. And you'll make your job site safe, which is always a good thing. Now, from structure, once we have the structure done, we move on to mechanical. Mechanical is HVAC, right? Heat and cooling systems, um, plumbing and electrical. I'm going to throw in there the idea of running a sound system. You also want to throw in there the idea of um, if you're going to do wired doorbells, incorporate that as well. Uh, welcome, Miss Tina Michelle, to the membership program. Uh, anything else that's mechanical be like chimneys, uh, uh, flues for exhaust, anything like that. And here's the rule. When you're working with this stuff, start with the one system that's the most difficult to find room for. That's the HVAC. They have big ducts, big pipes, okay? Run all your HVAC first because you want to give it a clean slate. And then you run your plumbing. Because plumbing has rules with, with slope, right? 
There has to be a certain slope for the water to go downhill in the right direction. And venting has to be in certain locations. So you want to do all this in a certain order so that you're not causing a problem for the next trade guy. Remember, electricians can run a wire just about any bloody place they have to. If they got to go four miles out of the way to go up six inches, it doesn't matter. They make wire long enough to do the job. So the point is, if anybody's going to be inconvenienced, it's the electrician. Because wire is very easy to find an alternative route. Plumbing and HVAC kind of stuck with it. So do it in the right order and you won't be disappointed. So if you're going to do your own electrical in your house and you haven't had the plumber in yet, don't do the electrical. Let the plumber come and do his thing first, okay? Just trust me. <laughs> because what they'll do if they run into problems is they're going to just cut your wire out of the way or they're going to do their plumbing in a way that's really inconvenient. And they're going to just back charge you for having done something dumb and gotten in the way. And those things you can avoid. Now, all of the mechanical, we're talking about the rough-in. When we're talking mechanical, we have a rough-in and we have a finish. So all of these trades, you end up getting in there twice. Now, HVAC guys usually only get in there once. And at the very end of the job, they'll come back and turn everything on, right? Because they don't want their HVAC machines running while you're in construction. So it's off. So they don't even have it tested yet. So generally, everybody has a, a, a start date and a return date, okay? So what want to remember is before we do the next phase, everybody's got all their rough-in done. All of your rough-in inspections are done to satisfy your permit, okay? So the HVAC has been checked out. The plumbing has been checked out. When you have a building permit, there's usually a plumbing inspector, and then there's a building inspector. And a lot of times, there are two different people. So make sure you've made all your phone calls, got all your inspections done, got them to sign off. Not just that they were there, but they actually signed off and said, yes, you can go ahead. Get your electrical safety inspector in there, get signed off, all right? Once you've got all that, then it's time to drywall. Now, drywall is, uh, we use a phrase in our business, we call it, it's time to close. Because we're closing, we're covering everything up. Once we install the drywall, we can't see nothing, which is why you need your plan. Right, you got to make sure that your hot and cold water supply lines are on the right side. <laughs> you got to make sure all your drains are in the right location. It's not just that it's done, but it's done right. So make sure that you check if you hire somebody that your plan for your um, sink drain, for instance, is in the right location, not just on the wall, but on the height off the floor. You have wall mount vanities, you've got vanities with legs. You want to have the plumbing coming through the wall, not the floor, whenever possible. Um, you've got all kinds of scenarios with doors and drawers and, and depths and allowances. Make sure you're communicating the expectation of the plumber what he's got to do. Because if you have your plan in front of you, you can say, and this type of vanity requires this kind of access. And if there's a problem, he's got to fix it. But if you don't tell him, he's just going to do a standard kind of installation. It may not be copacetic and you got to get him to do it twice. All right. And if you're doing it yourself, same thing. Know what you're putting in. Don't go wait until the very end and say, okay, the bathroom's ready, honey. Let's go shop for a vanity. Big mistake because there are so many different options out there and so many different rough-in applications depending on the style of vanity you buy. You might find yourself opening up the wall and doing it all over again because you could only find one vanity you're both happy with and it requires the plumbing to move. Maddening. Now, once you've closed... We're moving on to the flooring and the tile, right? Closed means you've done drywall, three coats, sanded, primed, prime check, painted the ceilings, probably first cut and roll on the walls. And I usually recommend to leave the second cut until the very end because there's usually enough moving around and dings and stuff going on that there's going to be minor bits of wall damage that you can patch and repair and get a first coat of paint on after the primer and then you can paint the second coat all together when you're done building. But flooring, you really wanna get in after you've done all of that, right up to the first coat of paint. You wanna minimize the amount of painting and dirt and dust that's in that building. So having all of that done and sanded and cleaned and finished up and vacuumed out, have a nice clean house when you put in your floors, okay? One of the mistakes a lot of people do when they're doing renovations is they get to the flooring too fast, they're excited, and they haven't cleaned properly, okay? And then every time you take a step on the door, on the floor, the air moves and it pushes the dirt out. <laughs> and you get this dust cloud of debris from underneath the floor. If you've ever seen a laminate floor job where they were cutting with a saw in the basement and they installed the laminate floor, the basement is covered in that fine dust while they're working. And then every time you take a step, it kicks out again. That's a formaldehyde dust. It is not nice to breathe in. 
So listen, try to do all your cutting outside when you get to the flooring, if you can, or use products like the, the vinyl plank. It's just a utility knife. You cut it and you snap it. If you're not sure about this stuff, just go to our homepage about anything and just search the topic you want. And the YouTube um, uh, algorithm out there will actually formulate a list of, of all the different videos that touch your subject matter. Okay. It's a great way to research. Now, when we're doing our flooring, we want to do our flooring. We want to finish it. You don't want to do half your flooring. You don't want to do part of the floor. You want to just get it done. Finish what you start. That's a whole system. So when all the floors are in, the only thing that should be left at that point, and it's really up to you, is you've got all the finished carpentry on the baseboards and casings. I know there's a big debate. Here's the debate in a nutshell. If you have a professional tool for cutting floor jams, okay, um, door jams, sorry, around around uh, the casing and the door jam and the casing, it's, it's a jam saw, okay? It's about 400 bucks. Usually only the pros own this tool. You've never even seen it on my channel. If you have a jam saw, you can do all of the carpentry in the entire house first, then install your floors, and then you just put on a little bit of shoe mold, okay? And it's a really fast way to do it because then when you're doing your painting process, all of your trims are painted. All the walls have got one coat. You've got your cut line all sorted out. It's so quick and easy. After the floors go in, it's just a quick shoe mold and a little touch-up paint done, right? But a lot of people like to put in all the flooring and then do all their trim. And these are people who don't own a jam saw. Most of you are in that group. If you don't own a professional jam tool for cutting out around the doors, so install your flooring, you might want to consider installing your flooring before all of your doors. If you install the doors afterwards and then all the trim afterwards, you've also got to use site protection. Okay? Cover your floors. Ram board is probably a great idea. There's also heavy construction paper you can put out there and you can tape all the joints. What you want to do is manage your site so that you don't have dirt and screws and debris underneath whatever you're using to cover your floor. So seal it up tighter than a drum and then you can protect your floor from damage while you're working. But the more work you're going to do, the better the protection. I've seen guys use tarps and plywood on top of it. I'm not a fan of tarps because it's really easy to lose nails and screws in it. But the cardboard or RAM board is a really nice product. You'll see that in HGTV all the time because money is not an issue. But uh, it's take care of your site and it'll take care of you. Nothing worse than finishing a job, pulling everything off, and finding this great big scratch in the middle of the living room. I mean, oh, my God, how maddening is that, right? Now you've got your flooring down. Now it's time for your final paint, okay? Now it's time for you to inspect your walls for damage. Grab your 45, patch, 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 sand, little primer, brush on your first coat, and then you've got your first coat all finished. You can cut and roll the entire house, all right, using a tarp, and it is really quick and simple and satisfactory. <laughs> Feels great to get the second. Now you're at substantial completion here, all right? Substantial completion means that everything's functioning. Like if you go to the bathroom, you can take a shower, you can use the toilet, you can use the sink, the fan operates, the power is on, everything's working, okay? There's still one stage left. And so after you've got all your fixtures on, you still have one thing left, and that's called the punch list, all right? So what I'm going to suggest for DIYers out there doing your own renovations, when you're done, before you invite everybody over to the house and you say, look what I did, take a day off, go empty your mind, right? Get into a little personal coma, come back out, and then go and walk through your house and you be the pickiest person in the world on your own job and you make a list. And we call this the punch list. Now in construction, we usually let the homeowner do their own punch list. Um, and the reason we do that is because everybody's different. And so they'll, they'll tolerate all kinds of mistakes and they'll only highlight the things that actually bother them. And that's what gets fixed. I know it's rude, but that's how most people operate. So if you go and you go be the pickiest person you can imagine and you go, this could be better, that could be better, make your whole punch list. Okay, then maybe you can invite someone over who's a friend of yours and say, hey, can you help me out with this punch list? What do you think of this? Is that necessary? Is that necessary? But there's nothing worse than doing a whole renovation, having people come in and go, well, that's, that's all right. You know, and because they're looking at all the things that they wouldn't have never allowed to pass, right? Anyway. Um, here we go. When you're done, get a ginger ale. Yeah, no kidding. Jeff's <laughs> You guys, the chat makes me laugh every time. All right. 
There's my chat. And take it for what it's worth. Um, renovating isn't difficult if you have a plan. But without one, you're just driving down the highway at 180 miles an hour, and you don't even know if you're on the right side, heading into traffic or driving away from it. All right. Now we're at that point where I'm going to say goodbye to the notes. Okay. And then we're ready to take your uh, questions. Now, I'm not allowed to have that on the table either. I'll just play with it the whole day. No clicking pen tonight. Imagine that, eh? All right. Well, Melanie, I'm glad you appreciated that because you know what? Sometimes we just need to remind it that there is a process. Now, that's my process. Everybody has their own little thing. But for me, the biggest part of a good renovation really comes down to planning. And I find most people don't do enough of that. All right. So I got a question here. Matt, that's a super chat. I didn't even know if we were supposed to be taking those tonight, but I guess I can't ignore it, can I? All right. I don't have the ability to turn super chat off. So I guess if you're watching, you're not a member and you want to super chat a question, that's fine. I'll have to answer you. <laughs> It'd be rude not to. Um, but let's, uh, let's get into the questions with the members as soon as we can. Um, so we got Jeff, I'm listening while insulating my attached garage. Do I need a vapor retarder like certainty membrane in Washington state without garage heaters? No. If you're not heating it, you don't have a vapor issue. All you're doing with insulating is uh, slowing down the temperature variations that are going to happen and making it more comfortable. Now, if you're using a paper faced insulation, then you don't need a vapor barrier. If you are intending to cover the walls with drywall, you don't need a vapor barrier. But if you're only insulating, then I would put in the plastic just so that you have good air quality in that garage. All right. That's just personal experience. Um, if you're doing fiberglass or mineral wool, it doesn't really matter. You're going to want to have something in there. So every time you slam the door, you don't get crap falling out of the ceiling onto your head. Right. I mean, that's really the bottom line. So, oh, Ahmed wants to know if he can drill his joist for HVAC. I'm going to answer your question in the forum today. <laughs> I don't like four inch holes. I don't even like three inch holes, especially in dimensional lumber. My, most floor joists are only 10 inches wide, which means nine and a quarter. And so unless you have brand new engineered floor joists where you can drill a hole in the particle board, then I don't recommend doing it. Dimensional lumber is just too prone to splitting and cracking. So try to avoid it at all costs. The only other way you can get around it, and we've done this before, is um, an engineer, structural engineer, will, will, will make a schematic for us. And we'll add three-quarter plywood with construction adhesive and structural screws on each side of the joist and then drill a hole. That can be done. But, like, if you want to drill holes in your thing that's holding the roof over your head, go right ahead. <laughs> no one can stop you. But I would recommend getting a structural engineer in there just to make sure that you're not uh, creating an environment where your house is going to collapse. All right. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. Here we go. I'm going to try to read. We have rental property. We're on the fence about whether to renovate or just sell. Should one hire someone to do the design of the new space or can do myself and what program to use? Yeah, see, that's a million dollar question, right? There's a lot of software out there. I mean, House has one. HGTV even has their own software now. You're going to find with this software that it is really detailed. Some of the best software I've ever worked with in my life was... Um, at a company I used to work for, but they had, they had, they had the specs for every appliance and every faucet and every electrical fixture that they sold in their computer system. And it was incredible. But the degree that those systems work really is to the degree that you're willing to sit down and input the information. So if you're not familiar with the program, sometimes it's nice just to hire a designer to come over, measure off, and have them input it and, and play around. Sometimes paying someone for a few hours of work so that you can you know, go through a design option on a software is a good thing. I don't expect everybody to become software experts, but there are good two-dimensional software programs out there for layout and space. And sometimes that's just not enough. You need to see it 3D. So the more information you want before you start, the more you got to pay. But knowing where you're going is important. Um, for me personally, the whole renovator cell, this is not the right year to renovate. Just saying, unless you do a lot of work and you've got contractors that you know, I'll put it to you this way. If you don't have relationship this year, you're not going to be able to start one. Okay, it's the wrong year to start a relationship with a the contractor. They're going to be busy. They're going to be booked. 
Okay. If you're not making phone calls now for something you're doing six months, forget about it. Not going to happen. All right. It's going to be another one of those years, just like last year. We're just going to consider it. That's the standard course. It's easier to adjust that expectation if people actually start answering the phone again. But that's pretty much where we are. Okay, Matt, I'm on Trevor at the top of the screen here. Could I quickly review the process of how to frame a 12 inch tall by 24 inch wide niche in a shower? Yeah, you cut lumber so that you leave that space plus a half inch all the way around. And then you insert Schluter half inch curdy board on all of those sides. It's really that simple. Um, you'd probably maybe have to watch that video again. Uh, okay, here we go. The HVAC question. I was wondering if you're going to get back in there. Uh, your filter is only being two thirds used when you replace them. So does that mean it's sticking out of the machine? Because, oh, you're using 25251. Well, I'm going to suggest you buy a 16251. That's a very standard filter. And it'll probably all go in and save you some money. Uh, the, if you want to know, those numbers actually relate to the actual dimension in inches. So you can use a tape measure and you can measure the, the rise on that filter box and then the width and the length. And then you just go buy what you need. So it's going to be that simple. But if you have a piece of filter sticking out, just go buy the 16s. All right. 16, 25 ones, you'll be just fine. OK, so Don is saying thanks for helping him uh, take on things at the home. Yeah, my channel's giving him confidence. Oh, he's just giving me love. Howell, Michigan. Cheers to Hal Michigan, and cheers to you, Don. Happy to help, man. Uh, Sandy Rose, uh, Jeff, Tina Michelle has a good question. Could you put the list of 13 steps in the comment section or somewhere? Um, yeah. Matt, maybe you can go and pick up that piece of paper, and uh, I'll, put it in, I'll put it in the video description for future reference. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Scott's got a split entry space under the stairs, and it's not finished. Okay. Uh, U-shape, got it. Main water line comes in there. Should I put in green board? I want to put in easy flooring like self-sticking carpet squares. Thoughts? Okay, so you got the main water line coming in there. My first thought is you need to protect that water line from accidental damage. If you're going to start using this space and you're putting in carpet squares, I'm thinking you're going to have critters going under there. I'm talking like little people, right? Um, they really don't pay too much attention to copper water supply lines uh, or CPVC, and it, they're not impervious to damage. So if you're going to be using a space like that, then maybe you just make a, a little box and some sort of a wooden cover so you can cover your water supply line or even a tower, right? Throw a couple screws in it. Uh, something like that may not be a bad idea, just so you can protect yourself. If you screw it to the wall, though, if you have an emergency, you can't unscrew it fast enough. So slide it in place. All right. And that would be my answer there. I wouldn't use dr green drywall, for instance. Your water supply in your house is not a source of uh, moisture. It's a source of water. But the rest of the room isn't going to be affected by it. So you can use any drywall you want. Um, Mike wants to know about laminate floor damage. How can I replace one board that is damaged? <laughs> yeah, I got a secret for that, Mike. I wonder if I can even demonstrate that. Okay. So let's pretend that this table, Matt, is this whole table in the view? Uh, no. To about here? Yep. Okay. And over to here. All right. Let's say that this is a laminate board. All right. I'm going to use these little decks and we're going to call that the end. Okay. So from here to here, what I do is I take my skill saw and I set the depth of the blade to the depth of the laminate. All right. And I'll drop the skill saw in the middle of the board over here and drive it right to the other side. And I go about a quarter to three eighths of an inch shy of the joint. All right. And then what I do is I take a chisel. Oh, sorry. I cut two lines. You want to cut like a, about one inch out of the board. So two lines all the way down the same. And you take a chisel and you finish those cuts right to the joint. All right. And you throw in a screw in the middle of it, just a half an inch down. And you just lift out that cutout piece. All right. From there, you should be able to use that chisel, manipulate both sides of that flooring because now that it's just one tongue and groove you can manipulate them out and then all you do is you take the next piece of flooring that you're replacing with because laminate is brilliant in this one regard every board's the same length and you know when you've got your locking tongue and groove right if you take a knife or a table saw and you just remove the extra groove okay so you can lock in the one tongue and you can just lay it in place 
then when you're laying it in place, use an actual um, high density fiber glue and put it on all three sides. Set that panel back down, throw some weight on it, maybe a couple of weights from the gym or a couple gallons of paint, and you can let it dry overnight and it'll be good as new and no one will ever know that you replaced it. All right, so hopefully that helped. It might have made a little bit of sense, but uh, that's a great idea for a video. Matt, you got a pen on you? I just wrote it down. Thank you, buddy. Because yep. I would love to do something like that. We're going to do a series of um, uh, quick, simple repairs, right? So that's, that'd be good. We'll put that one in the list. Okay, uh, blah, 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 blah. where are we? Um, you've got one? Oh, sorry, oh yeah, I was already there. Oh, um, okay, Avi's got a question. Uh, for a shower niche, you have red guard and going straight over the drywall with it. For the shower niche, do I need anything extra on those joints, edges of the niche? Yeah. You know, it really wouldn't hurt. Um, exposed drywall and red guard aren't really a great mix. So you might want to actually tape, like with drywall tape, tape the edges. If you've got exposed drywall, as soon as you put paper tape there, then you've got a surface that's really easy to seal up. Okay. So definitely recommend that. Um Forrest Gump. I love the name. All right. Where did he go? Whoa. Um, I'm going to get dizzy. Here we go. Uh, Forrest Gump says, I've replaced a lot of wiring in my house where the old AC comes through the wall. Do I just cut it off and leave the ends exposed or put wire nuts on dead cables? Well, if it's a dead cable, then you should remove it. Okay. Um, where the old AC comes through the wall, usually it's filled with silicone. That's not going to stop you from yanking that wire out of the way. Uh, do yourself a favor. Keep it as clean as you can. If you don't need it, rip it out. It's just the end of the day. The, the less fuss that you leave in behind the walls, you're not just doing yourself a favor because it'll look clean today, but you're doing someone a favor down the road who's going to renovate. You don't have to stop and take stock and test every wire and understand where everything run is going and do, do you do the, all of you made any favor, guys? When you're doing wiring, if you've got a dead circuit or a dead line somewhere, just remove the whole thing back to the beginning. All right, it'll save you from confusion and the possibility of making a circuit live that you don't want live because you can get confused. And then all of a sudden, you've got this live power just laying around the floor. And man, that would really hurt. All right, how easy it or difficult to redesign my HVAC ducts in the basement? Okay. Well, I don't know. It all depends on your basement, your layout. Do you have one trunk line and a bunch of ducts coming off of it? Um, redesigning is simple because it wasn't really much of a science to begin with, right? They got a, a box that moves a lot of air, and then they have five or six inch pipes that move a little bit of air. And they usually have one pipe for about every 300 square feet of living space. And it should come off the side or the top. The top is usually better because heat rises. So that's usually how they make it work. Um, if you want to redesign it and move it from one location to the next so that you can save boxing, then feel free to do that. We actually do a video where I uh, drop an HVAC line down an interior wall just to bring the heat right to the floor. Uh, there's tips and tricks in that video that if you search on the YouTube homepage, uh, you, you'll be able to use that and, and relocate all your ducks. John has a question. Thanks, Jeff, for all the tips and tricks. Give me the confidence to raise a sunken living room and install new hardwood on one level. Well, I just hope you have enough ceiling room for that. <laughs> but that's cool. Happy to help, man. Uh, raising a sunken living room is simple, right? Because when you think about it, a floor is just floor joists and plywood. So if you want to get rid of a sunken living room, just add some new lumber, treat them like floor joists, and put plywood on it. Piece of cake. Nothing to it, eh? Uh, North of 60 joined the membership program. Welcome. Cheers to the DIY crew. Uh, Matt wants to know if I have any tips and tricks for working with glass subway tile for backsplash. Best way of cutting without chipping. Do I need a finished edge? Yeah, the best way to cut glass is with a wet saw. Um, and the best way to have a great look when you're finished is use oversized electrical plates. Okay, they, they, they have like uh, king plates or, or oversized plates or whatever they're going to call them in your electrical area. So you're going to have a standard size which doesn't leave a lot of mercy if you have a, a, a cut and, and it, you get that shattered look, right? And it deflects the light different and you can see it from the side. If you go with the oversized electrical plates, all your cuts will look perfect. Design your backsplash so that you're not finishing with a cut, okay? 
on the outside corners. And if you have an interior corner, that's a great place for a cut because you're usually going to put a bead of silicone on there anyway, and that covers a multitude of sin. All right. Um, Christopher wants to know, my wife has concerns living near a natural gas well. Benzene. Okay. What measure would you take to filter air better or protect the air envelope inside? Wow. Okay. Well, you know, if it's really a concern, move. <laughs> I don't really know. Um, uh, your air quality is going to be related to how much air you have coming into your house. So how good is your house seal? So you could do an air blower door test and find out if your house is actually sealed up pretty good. If not, you can seal it up better. You can do take measures to get less air coming in passively into your house so that only air that's being filtered comes into your house. That's probably the best you can do. But, um, oh my, I don't know if you can filter out gas if it's leaking into your house. So you might want to consider, it's like, it's like the guy that moved next to a swamp and he was tired of getting... Uh, you know, bit by mosquitoes. So we've tried every different way to fight the mosquitoes. And at the end of the day, all I had to do was move. Like, it's a thought. Um, love your channel. Sometimes practical just means being practical, right? <sighs> love your channel. I'm two months into my first home purchase and I'm 70% done with finishing my basement. <laughs> okay. Wow. Hope that works out well for you. <laughs> I usually suggest you wait a year before you do a major project when you buy a new house, but um, uh, you did it all by yourself. Uh, cheers. Um, well, thanks, man. You know, I'm, 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 I'm glad that worked out well. I hope it's not a brand new home. If the house has been around for a few years, at least you're able to diagnose what the problems are with it. Where are we heading to, Matt? Beautiful. Brad Whitaker has a question. I'll stay there. Any tips for laying down linoleum without glue? Yeah. Buy the new... Um, linoleum flooring and it actually they make a, um, a no adhesive necessary version of it it's a very heavy mat right this stuff is brilliant you can just lay it in place throw on some trims around the room stick a toilet on it and it's never going anywhere I'm telling you right now as long as that's in contact with osb or plywood there's so much friction with that underside of that layman it works amazing you'll never even know it's a floating floor okay so don't even think twice. There's no trick. Roll it up like a scroll, okay, to put it into the room, and then unroll it, and then just adjust it a little bit until your one edge is perfect. Trim around your door, trim around your door, and keep on rolling and trimming as you go, all right? That's the, that's, that's the best way to install that stuff. It works like a charm. And if you overcut somewhere and you make a nasty mess and a big gash, all right. You can always buy what's called a um, like seam binder glue for, for linoleum floors. They used to use it like they do a whole basement, 2,000 square feet, and they'd have multiple rolls, and they'd have a huge seam right down the middle of the room. They'd have a seam binder with a semi-gloss finish on it. And you can still buy that stuff. You can fix your cuts so that it doesn't trap dirt. And that stuff is brilliant. Um, other than that, just use a sharp knife and always cut away from yourself. <laughs> Cheers. All right. Another super chat. Travis is, uh, Jeff, I'm looking to buy a large log cabin home to live in, possibly in Tennessee or Colorado. Do you have any thoughts on log cabins? design maintenance or what to look out for you know um wow no not really uh i love the look and the thought the idea of having eight inches of wood it's a great insulator right so they they're very effective they're just you've got to like living inside a log cabin too uh i know lots of people who've uh, taken log cabins and they've modified them over time so the interior space is so small it's not even funny but you know i get the peel i mean it's beautiful right uh functionality wise Solid as rock. So I got nothing bad to say about it. I think it's probably a better construction style than the way that we're building homes now. It's just, it uses a lot of material. So if that doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me. So cheers to you. All right. Now John wants to know. Oh, we've already done that one. Other question. My bad. My apologies. <laughs> we're having technical difficulties tonight and my lips don't work today. What finished trim or profiles do you recommend for a bathroom, bathtub, tile. Okay. You want to know about finish trim or profiles for bathroom tile. You know, for bathroom tile, if you're doing a DIY tub, I love a tile that has a, um, a contour on the edges because it helps to hide lippage. 
because most people don't install their drywall and make sure all their walls are perfectly plumb and square and level and true and all that jazz, right? They just put it on and then tile what's there. So if you buy something with a beveled edge, like we used in our kitchen in the farmhouse, it covers a multitude of sin. That kitchen wall has got a huge bow on it and it bows the other way too. But because it's all beveled tile, the light's bouncing in every different direction. Even though there's a ton of lipids, you can't see any of it because when you have a good beveled tile and you're not using much of a grout line, you can actually polish the grout joints in and the grout joints are so consistent, all the lippage disappears. So it's a great way to cover a multitude of sins in the tile world. That's why subway tiles were so popular back in the first were used because they were all beveled. You couldn't make a mistake with that if you tried. Like you really had to go out of your way to mess that up. All right. Um, Sarah has a question here. I'm tiling over my mom's laminate backsplash. She'd like me to do the wall behind her stove, which is wallboard. Should I use the same mortar there too or use tile adhesive in that area? Okay. So I'm assuming, Sarah, you're watching our tile over tile video and you're using the ultralight um, cement and you're using the primer. My suggestion, if because you've already got the cement, if there's enough there to finish the job, I'll guarantee you have enough primer to finish the job. I would just finish it all the same way. That's really my honest opinion on that. Um, A, because if you're going to have two different surfaces, there's going to be the depth of laminate over the drywall. You can actually just uh, um, put the same trowel on the wall and then back butter the tile, add a little bit extra cement so that you finish nice and flush, okay? So I would keep using the cement. If you switch to the adhesive, you might have to use so much adhesive to build out to make it flush that it's not holding the tile very well and it could cause you some issues. And they're gonna dry at different rates too. So if you use the cement, the next day you're ready to go with your grout, no worries. If you end up using too much adhesive to get it flush, you might have to wait three or four days depending on the size of your tile for it to finish drying and that could cause you problems if you don't have the patience to, to know or wait or whatever, right? So stick with one material. When in doubt, cement always works. Adhesive can run into trouble if it gets too wet during the grout process or the washing process if it hasn't finished curing. So cement is always safe. And if you got more in the bag, I'd stick there. Okay. Oh, all right, Matt. So Shay has a question. She owns a condo on the third floor and made of wood. Very common. I can feel the holes in the kitchen near the fridge. Okay. How would you go about fixing it or would you get a contractor all together? Okay. Shay, thanks for the question. I'm a little confused. I'm going to need you to follow up. So you own a condo, third floor. I get it. It's made of wood. I need to know what kind of flooring you have in that kitchen. And what you mean by I can feel the holes in the kitchen near the fridge. Was this renovated? And did they have like um, holes in the floor where plumbing was coming through before? And is it the holes translating and the new flooring? Um, we'll get back to that question. If you can give us an answer, we'll just uh, keep following Matt. If you can keep an eye out for Shay's answer there, it'd be great. Thanks, buddy. Okay, so Lewis wants to know what the proper way to do stub out for PEX water supply lines. The proper way. <sighs> okay, so I don't know if you've seen this or not, but um, PEX water supply lines have these uh, round plastic brackets. And you can actually hook onto the PEX and it locks from both different, all three different sides, right? Left, right, and back to the left again. And what it does is it creates a perfect 90 degrees over four or five inches. And you can buy them, and they're usually made of plastic or metal, and they've got a little bracket on them. You can use that to screw to the wall. If you use those brackets, then you have your water line coming out of the wall, parallel to the, perpendicular to the wall, sorry, but also screwed in place, and it's guaranteed not to kink. That, to me, is a perfect assembly for bringing pecs out of the wall. Your other option is to put on an angle, right? Put it on a fitting, like a 90 fitting, and then add a couple clamps. Both of those are acceptable. There's other options out there. You can get as creative as you want. But generally, that dollar plastic bracket is, is just a great way to do it. And it keeps it from moving around, right? So that when you're finished, everything can be cut and snug and slid on your cover plates and your shutoff valves. And 
nothing is being jiggly. Everybody gets nervous when the plumbing is moving in and out of the wall, right? So those brackets are great. Um, Barbara wants to know, um, for Mr. Furnace Return Air, I'm going to assume that's a typo, my furnace return air, is there any reason why I shouldn't put an opening in the duct near the basement floor? I think it would help draw the hot air down. Okay, so you have a furnace return air. Shouldn't put an opening in the duct near the basement. Okay, so every return air has a big, big trunk, and it's racing along the ceiling, and then it comes down and then enters the furnace at the bottom of the furnace. I get this. Now, if you put an opening at, right at the base there, you're going to be disrupting the balance and the pressure in the system, okay? I would hesitate doing that. If, if you want to have cold air return to the floor, I would suggest you add a duct to that cold air return duct further away from the furnace somewhere and then bring it to the floor, at least six feet, okay? And here's why. You, you, when you're operating your furnace and your fan is blowing, it creates a suction. And if the suction can be satisfied by that hole just right next to it, by the most part, then you're not going to be pulling cold air out of all the other rooms. And when you're pushing air into a room, you really want to have the cold air being pulled out of the room at the same time, which is why the furnace always starts first before the heat. Having a nice balanced pressure makes the system work well. And if you change the way that the pressure works on that system, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to be trying to push air into a room that's already full of air, okay? And if it's not being pulled out by the suction on the cold air, then you're trying to push it in. It's like blowing up a balloon. You can only get so much air in there before your lungs are ready to explode, right? So just use that as your concept. You're blowing your balloon. You're blowing a balloon. It's just not getting any bigger. And, you know, you can't heat a space like that. So if you upset the balance by changing the, the pressure, it may not be a good idea. So maybe move six feet away from the furnace and drop a new line down so that at least your trunk line is being pulled consistently from the fan and all the lines coming off of it are getting the same kind of respect. All right. Um, Ryan's got a painting question. And listen, when I'm answering these questions, like I'm not an HVAC tech, okay? I'm just shooting off at the mouth with years of experience and what I have learned. If I don't have an answer, I will tell you I'm an idiot and I have no idea. If you're in the chat and you're an HVAC tech, feel free to jump in and say, oh, hey, by the way, yeah, that was good or bad or indifferent or otherwise, but I'm open to being corrected because the more I'm corrected, the more I learn. Anyway, uh, Ryan's painting question, any tricks to help paint fully cover lath and plaster textured wall? Think one quarter inch knuckle prints. First room took two coats and three rounds of touch up and there are still spots with old paint. Bah. Okay, so when you're painting and you've got serious texture, right? You really have to use a different nap roller, all right? The more texture, the thicker the fuzz on the paint roller needs to be, right? And you want to slow down and you want to back roll. So you want to apply it in one direction and then kind of back roll it and take it off in the other direction. The best advice that I've got for painting with that kind of situation is paint the entire room with plaster. Paint the entire room in a flat oil. Use, use like an odorless zinser as a primer. This is one of the only times you need primer. Like the whole world's obsessed with primer in the paint. Like they're selling you something. They're, they're full of crap. There's no such thing as primer in paint. It's a marketing tool. But on plaster, you actually need a primer. You need a flat oil that will seal up that wall and then it has to be something that will bond to modern tech, which is a water base with acrylic. And if you can't make that transition, your paint will peel. So a good flat oil, like an odorless zinser, comes in a green label can all over North America. You can't miss it. That's going to be your answer. You prime it with that. And then because you're dealing with oil paint, you got to let that dry overnight. Okay. The next day when you paint, you apply a coat of paint. Now you got to give it about two or three hours, turn a fan on, open windows. If it's in the winter time and you can't, give it a full six hours or a day. Let that paint cure. Let it dry fully. Remember, once you put the oil on, it's like a vapor barrier. So your new water-based paint is attached to it. It's happy to be there. They're all best friends, but it can't dry except back into the room. 
the wall's not absorbing moisture anymore. So if you're only applying water-based paints on drywall products, half of the drying is going into the wall. The other half goes into the room until the paint's dry. And then the wall board slowly releases the moisture back into the room over time with relative humidity. So your painting process changes. You can't just do a first coat in 30 minutes, zip around the room and do another coat because now you're adding wet on wet. And you're going to go through a lot of paint when you do that because you're not getting good coverage. You just keep putting it on and taking it off and putting it on, taking it off. It's going to drive you crazy. All right. So let it dry fully and then paint again. It slow down your process and you'll be a lot more successful. Where am I, Matt? Ah, can I use this laminate trick on hardwood? Um, yes. Anything that has a tongue and a groove, the same cutting process works. Okay. Just cut one inch out of the middle. So you've got some room, wiggle room for your fingers. You can even make it two or three inches wide if the board's wide enough. I mean, I've done this on two and a quarter inch hardwood flooring before. You can modify anything, especially if you have a, a, a multi-tool. Okay. Tongues and grooves are a system for installation. And if they're in your way, you can remove them and then rely on the adhesive as the installation system, if that makes any sense. They're not a prerequisite. They don't have to be there. It's just, it's just that's how it's all locked together. But if you don't want to rely on it, you can change your ad, an installation system and go to adhesive and rely on it instead of the tongue and groove. Okay. Where are we, bud? Welcome, Robert Hernandez, to the membership program. Uh, Force Gump wants to know about remove old wires behind an unbroken plaster wall. Yeah, you can't. I know. Like, I, here I am preaching, hey, rip it all out. But um, if you've got old plaster walls and you're not opening, it, until you open it, you don't have access, don't, don't, make it a, don't make it a mission in life. There's no law. You're not, you're not breaking any rules, okay? But be as diligent as you can with removing old, taking out junk, it's just be good to your neighbors, right? Yeah, it's always that one guy, you know, open up the ceiling and a whole renovation is in the floor from above and it pours out on your head, right? If you knew the name of that guy in that moment, you would be in his door, in his face, right? <laughs> we all know it. So don't be that guy, right? Be kind. All right. Je Trevor wants to know, Jeff, have you ever used expansion connections on PEX? What are your thoughts? Is it true these connections help with the drop in flow associated with using PEX? Okay. <sighs> Two issues there altogether. A, um, expandable PEX or Upanor PEX is amazing. Okay. It's a great technology. Uh, I'm looking at it for the new year, but to the best of my knowledge, it's still too expensive to buy all the tools to be able to do this system. Okay. It's really for professional trades. Now, um, I keep my eyes out, and if I ever see anybody start renting this thing on a regular basis and it makes sense, I'm going to suggest it. But for now, it's really, it's a tool cost. It's like the jam saw. 400 bucks just so I can cut the wood around a door? Really? When we used to do tile, I used to do contract tile, guys. I mean, I used to do um, three, five, 600 square feet a day, and our job was made incredibly easy with that tool. It was necessary. The first thing we'd do, we'd go in, we'd lay out the tile, we'd know the thickness, we'd cut all the doors, then we'd clean up. We never had another problem for the rest of the install. It was done. Six, seven doors, just get it done. It takes three minutes. But the average person isn't buying that tool. Same with the Supernor Pex. Okay, it's still too specialized a technology. Now, as far as the drop and flow associated with using Pex, <laughs> I always get a kick out of this because I don't know if this is a mythology, mythology or if this is a real question. Whoever said there's a drop in flow? Like, is this just talk? Have we all just accepted this? Because I know one thing. When you talk about a shower, right, the smallest hole in the shower system is not the pecs. It's the cartridge in the shower. That's got the smallest hole in it. It's really tiny. And so if you want to talk about where's the drop in the flow, sometimes it's just the whole, I went from an old system to a new system and understand that all new shower systems are being designed to save and conserve water. All right. They're not designed to let that water come through the system. They've got filter screens and reducers and air and filter infiltration systems. And they're trying all the things they can do to make you feel like you're having a shower from the 1980s. But in reality, they're giving you a third of the water they used to get. So 
be careful with that because I don't think PEX has got a problem. I'll tell you what right now. If you've got your PEX and you've got it capped and you've got your pressure on, if you want to know what your flow is like, okay, take your PEX cutter while your water is on and cut it off and see how long it takes to fill a pail of water and see if the person that's with you watching you do that can get to the main shutoff in time and turn it off before you flood out your house because that'll tell you how much flow you got. I I'm thinking you're going to be pretty surprised. If you've ever cut a water line that made a PEX, you know how much flow there is. I don't think that's your issue. Now, Shay. I see Shay. I, Matt's got his hand up. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, we're five minutes past that hour mark. Okay. Just so you know. And? Uh, we're doing a four-hour show. We're doing a two-hour show. No, we're doing a two-hour show today. Two right. Yeah, we're going to run a little late because we sure got started late. Sure. All right. You know, I'm going to get all the sleep I need when I'm dead. All right. So, um, so okay, let's get to Kyle. Kyle's got a question. His master bath has water lines coming through the floor and drain through the exterior wall. Can the water lines be moved into the wall? Um, okay, you're in the Midwest. Here's the deal. Um, water lines, if you have freezing temperatures, you want to have them on the inside of a vapor barrier system if you're using one. I like interior walls for water, su water supply for the following reason. If you ever get a mouse in that house and it eats a tunnel in your insulation, that's all it takes for the cold air to then be blowing right on the water supply. All it takes is a good, uh, what's your scale? Maybe minus 15, maybe minus 10 kind of weather. If you get nice like that, your plumbing will be frozen in the morning, guaranteed. And you can thank your local rodent. So you're taking a risk by going to an exterior wall no matter what, because you can't control all of the factors that are at play there. So if you're going to do it, use a, an air barrier on the wall where you're running your plumbing, right? So the drafts can't blow fearlessly at your water line, and that'll help to minimize or mitigate your risk. But I would always prefer to go interior. Just me. I'd sooner build a box in a corner of a living room and run my plumbing in it before I tried to shove it inside of a stud wall cavity. And, but it's got to be on the warm side of the room regardless, right? Never insulate some plumbing. There, except from the outside. <laughs> okay, let's go back to Shea. Shea has linoleum floors. They're peel and stick covers the kitchen floor in my condo. Okay, I can feel holes or dips in the floor when we walk near the fridge. Okay, so Shea, here's the deal. The hole that you might be feeling, it may not be an actual hole through the whole floor. There's a lot of guys out there who cut corners when they're doing um, uh, flooring. And instead of buying the proper um, subfloor, which is incredibly smooth. Linoleum floors, like for sheet goods, we have a rule. It's gotta be a certain grade and it's gotta be flawless, right? It's gotta be like a sheet of glass almost. And we staple it down and we use a special compound and we fill staple holes and nooks and crannies and gaps because we wanna have it sanded and perfectly flat because sheet good linoleum that gets put on with adhesive translates those depths and those bumps. Now, if they used standard plywood there's going to be a bunch of little holes in it or sometimes it's like eye-shaped holes okay and those are just there's laminated layers of plywood and the knot from the tree popped out and it was glued down and now it's just left the impression like a dimple all right it's about um, about a sixteenth of an inch thick but over time when you walk you're putting pressure on the flooring and it starts to translate that's what it calls where now you can see these dents in the floor and they're always trapping dirt if it's a peel and stick, then you can peel it off and they do sell a floor patching compound at the local building store or your, your local box store, convenience store for construction. And you can just take a putty knife and fill it in and wait till it's dry. And then you can install a brand new tile again. Okay. And that will just basically, it's like a little miniature floor leveling system just for imprints and dents. And that'll solve your problem. So cheers. You're, you're back in the running. Um, <laughs> Paul Peck, <laughs> Encyclopedia of Building Knowledge. Really, eh? Yeah, six pages thick, Paul. Come on, really? All right. Um, Avi has a question. He's got a water softener system that came with the house. Well, that's a good thing. I'm not sure if it works. The salt tub is empty. I don't want to break anything, but would love to try it. Any ideas how to proceed? Well, if the salt tub is empty, you're not softening nothing. So I'd put some salt in there first off. Um, 
if you're not sure if it's working, what you can do is you can contact a local plumbing company that specializes in water purification systems. And you can look through the, your, your, your phone book or online, Google it. But there'll be somebody that advertises will come up and do a free water test or a free water analysis. Okay. And they'll be able to tell you um, if your water is hard or soft, if it's a simple sliding scale, it's not trickery. Uh, and then from there, you can decide if it's good enough the way it is, or if you think it's necessary to pay for an improvement, they can give you all kinds of options. Uh, it really all depends on how good and how safe you want your water to be. Or where do you live? Are you on a well? Are you in a city? Are you in an old industrialized city with really old water lines? Sometimes it pays to put good money into the filtration of your water system so that you can have confidence that you're not poisoning yourself to death. Um, and that's not slight to anybody who's going through hell with their water supply. It's just the truth. You got to be practical. Okay. Water it can leave the treatment center clean and end up in your glass poisonous. So if you're concerned, get it tested. My God, it's so easy to do. I mean, it's not like we got like when you turn 40 and you got to go see the doctor and he's got to do the rubber glove. It's just a water test, guys. Go get it done. Take care of your families. My God. All right. Now let's go to the next one. Uh, we got a question here. What is the deal with installing the drain in your garage in Ottawa? I don't know what the deal is. Building a new house and the builder told me they won't do it. Can it be DIY later? Purpose is to wash cars in the wintertime. Wow. Okay, um, I'm going to suggest that's not a good plan. Hey, you've got to have water supply in your garage in Ottawa in the wintertime. And it's cold here. Like, did you go out for a walk this morning? It was, what, minus 16? If you have a garage and you want to have it turned into a car wash, in this climate, you have to insulate the walls, the ceiling, the floors, and then put in plumbing and then where's your drain going to go? It's got to go back into the house. So you got to bust through the foundation of the wall of the house in order to put that drain in. There's no building code for it. If you want it and your builder won't do it and you really, really want it, then go pay for an engineer to drop the specs to build that system. Okay. Because if the builder isn't going to do it, then you've got to give an engineer report. So he's off the hook, but I guess it could be done, but you got a lot of systems to overcome there. And I don't know if you're going to be really satisfied trying to save that $12 a week at the gas station drive through car wash. It's going to cost you tens of thousands to put that car wash in there. Uh, it really is up to you. Rodney, I only have one question tonight. Okay, Rodney, it's your turn, man. Here we go. Please confirm the underlay, under pad for vinyl plank floor under corner website is the one you recommend in your video. Okay, so yes, it is one of the ones I would use. Okay perfectly happy with that the first underlay i did in my kitchen came from the decorner people it was the green one now the product might change the color might change the supplier might change but there is a certain um, level of quality in an under pad for vinyl and laminate floors that has an awesome sound transmission sound transmission ability to dampen the sound and reduce impact noise and it's really dense, okay? So, like, you, you know when you touch it. It's like it kind of just it slaps you in the face dense. So there's also another one out there, um, Goodfellow. Goodfellow makes one. There's a, there's, there's a couple of other underpads. If you Google for flooring supply wholesalers in your area and you give them a call and say, hey, what do you got for an underpad for under my laminate floors in a condominium? then they're going to have two or three choices for you. All of those will work. One of them is felt. Don't use it. But as long as it's a dense foam, you're fine to go with that. The point is, is that that dense foam does not interrupt with the locking system on the joints, and it gives you a great performance. Bam. Okay. Where are we, Matt? Roy. Roy has got a question. When working with pecs, is it preferable crimping or clamping? Okay. Um, yeah. This is my own fault. When we started this channel, I did videos on both, right? We weren't sure who our audience was or where we wanted to land. Now, guys, they both work. I'll just say that. I've used them both over my career. They both work. They both last a long time. It's not a concern. The 
the solid rings have a much lower failure rate immediately after installation. Okay? The clamps, they don't always grab just right. And so what you'll find is if you don't do pressure test and, and really, like, I mean, for a while, like a couple of hours of pressure testing, you aren't going to identify which one's going to pop off on you. You won't know until two months down the road after the project's finished, they start using that place, and then there's a wet corner because there's a little drip. That little drip becomes a big problem. So that's where we ran into problems with the crimps. Okay, so the solid ring is the best. The the other one, it's like it's like a pinch clamp. It works, but you really got to pressure test your lines abundantly before you close. Okay, like we talked today, the process before you hang drywall, pressure test for hours. Find something when you're wiring your house, your plumbing's done. Turn the water on, pressurize the lines. Right, maybe for a whole couple of days while you're doing your electrical, make sure that sucker works before you close it up. And, or you can just go with the solid rings and you don't have to think about it. If you put the solid ring in the right place and you fully close that clamp, you don't have to think. It's done. Finished. Don't have to, don't even have to test it if you ask me, but I would suggest you test it anyway. But I'm just saying uh, there's a lot more peace of mind with that other product. Now, where can I buy soundproofing materials in Canada? Uh, you recommended website does not ship to Canada. I'm looking for MLV resilient channel stud clips with rubber leg in your video. Okay. So if you want some good resilient channel clips, then you need to Google for a, um, a commercial drywall and soundproof material supplier in your area. All right. In Ottawa, there is one in the South end of town. Oh, I can't remember the, my brain's almost fried. Ah, uh, something brothers, Moran brothers. Yeah. The Moran brothers. All right. <laughs> Ching. Um, anybody can walk in off the street over there. They got a showroom. You just walk in, okay? And they've got a box there and they've got those clips. Um, and you can buy all your soundproofing products. They don't carry mass loaded vinyl. That's a product that's not even in this country. Now, what we do have is we have a different product. Oh boy, Maddie, I'm going to get myself in trouble here now. Got to remember all that product now. It's a green board. They just started carrying it at Home Depot in Canada, okay? Sonapan. Boom. Boom. Sonapan is the name. Now, Sonapan is a fabulous product. I've used it for years, but they had a distribution nightmare issue to deal with. They just couldn't get their product out of Eastern Ontario. You know, they, no matter what they did, th there was just no market for it. But finally, it looks like they're getting covered by Home Depot um, and maybe even Lowe's more across the board in Canada. It's an amazing product. It absolutely outperforms mass loaded vinyl. Yeah. It's better. It's also half an inch thick and it comes in four by eight sheets. It's a rigid board, easy to work with. Doesn't make dust when you're installing it. You can screw it to floor joists and then just screw your drywall right over top. Bam. How would he like me now? So we're probably going to have to do a video with using that stuff on our next project. Um, I would endorse it, but you know, Hey, I don't get paid to do things like that. So I just tell you the truth. It's great stuff and it'll solve your problem. So S O N O P A N. Uh, call your local Home Depot, ask if they got it. If they don't, it's part of their supply chain. They should be able to special order it for you. It's worth it, all right? Just order it like you would drywall. Measure off this total square footage. Get an extra sheet if you're doing a large space in case you're cutting around stuff. But yeah, definitely worth it, all right? Now, so cheers, Scott. That'll, uh, that'll save your bacon. It's easier to work with. It's lighter, and it probably costs the same or maybe even a little less. So feel free to go that way. You can put that stuff on, all right? Then your resilient clips. You don't even need the rubber. You can buy cheap clips. Get, get the 50 cent clips instead of the $3 ones because since it's been disen, disengaged from the wood, there's no direct transfer. You can throw a couple of screws in that and then attach your drywall. You're going to get an amazing um, uh, sound rating on that. I don't even know what it is. I bet they have that information on the website. Go ahead and check it out. I'm sure they've got some information on there on their, their sound um, transfer classification. Scott, is this the same Scott? Ash, yeah. I think so. huh. Buying a 1920 farmhouse with added room in 2002. Wall leans a half inch to the bottom, I'm going to guess, to five inches over eight feet between new and old room. Okay. Poor level or square wall or foundation issues possible. You're asking me. <laughs> I'm going to put a wager that somebody 
had a concrete patio on the back of the house. And they first had a patio. And then somebody went and said, you know what? Let's put a roof over that patio. And then someone said, you know, let's let's make it a screened-in porch. And they walled it in. And then someone said, you know what? Let's make this a three-season room. And then somebody said, you know what? Let's just uh, let's just make this an addition. And all they did was put windows in and call it a day. Well, you can't build an addition on a patio concrete foundation because it's not structural concrete. There's no footings. And so, yeah, things are going to change based on soil conditions. There's a lot more weight going on there. So that's probably what you got. There are tens of thousands of additions, all right, that are DIY, and there's more DYI. They have more done themselves in, all right? Um, so be real hesitant with that. When you're buying a house, always check, was there a permit pulled for this project? I know, it's like a broken record, right? Um, but it's worth it to ask, because uh, you're going to incorporate, or, you know, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to be getting somebody else's crap, right? There's no way to fix that. Because whatever you put in there, it's still on a bad foundation. That's disappointing. I know. You can fix it for a season. But, uh, yeah, have fun with that. Maybe the best thing to do is just uh, create a new uh, subfloor sleeper system. So you can go from zero to hero and then put in some plywood and at least have a level floor for a while until it moves again. But uh, you're pretty much guaranteed to more of the same over time. So you can fix it for 5, 10, 20 years, but it'll just keep on moving. All right, Matt, where are we? North of 60, do you need underlay for vinyl if it's already built into the vinyl? Yeah, no. Not if it's really good. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't seen any really good built-in underlays on vinyl yet. I've seen really poor attempts to call themselves underlay on vinyl, but none of them have a really good qualification for sound transfer. All right? If you're not sure what to do, I'm going to give a shout-out here to Florin Decor. They're building stores all over the all over the country. They got some really cool displays over there, and they have a like a golf ball on a string, and they got three different kinds of of underlay under the same kind of flooring. And you just do a little test, and you can hear the difference. It's like night and day. All right, just go to the store, invest five minutes, pop into their store, say Jeff sent me. I'm going to do the golf ball test. I want to know, and you will be amazed at the difference in a quality underlay versus the crap they're trying to pass off as an underlay. All right. So if you're going to spend good money on flooring, don't spend even better money because that has an underlay unless the underlay is of good quality. Just saying, right? Okay. It's like buying a car and it's got an amazing engine and it's got no windshield. Like how fast did you really want to drive? Uh, bum, 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 bum. Shay sent us some love. Cheers. Oh, cheers. Um, so there you go. So I probably hit the nail on the head. I bet you've got that. Um, that eye kind of hole, right? It's a little more oval. And you were like, that's the hole in my floor. So there, that's probably it. Very cool. You can do that, Shay. I know you can do it. And uh, you're going to be just fine. All right. So James got a question. I got, I also have a drain in my garage floor though. Not sure if it even goes anywhere because I've never put water down it. Looks like a DOI project from previous owner. And it might be. James, you might just have somebody who put a hole in their floor and put a drain cover on it. Don't forget, most garages, um, the foundation of the house is poured to the point where there's an interior foundation wall and an out exterior garage wall. And they just backfill it with clear stone. Yeah, so couldn't you just drain it into the clear stone? Right? So the thought is, can I just drain it into... You know, a little bit of water going in there isn't going to hurt anything. Okay? But... That system is not designed to evacuate that water. So you'll end up filling it up to the point, especially if you're washing your car every week because you're like taking care of your baby, you know. If you put too much water down there, now it's sitting against the foundation on the interior of the house. And it's going to work its way through underneath the wall because they pour the footing and then they attach a wall. There's a weak spot. And so now you're introducing water that's not designed to be there. And if it's a newer house, you're going to have a completely waterproof foundation and you're going to be the source of your own problem. If you put a drain in a garage, run it to the weeping tile at least, right? It doesn't have to come back into the house. But yeah, if you, James, if you got one of those, it's probably just, you know, hey, uh, I come in with my car. It's got some snow on it. Um, it's not too bad. And uh, the garage is usually a little warmer. So the snow melts and then uh, it's nice to have the water drain somewhere. So I can see people doing that. 
And over time, a little bit of water going in a hole in a garage floor will not cause a problem. All things are relative, and humidity especially is relative. The stone can get wet, and it'll transfer the moisture to the rest of the stone, all the concrete. Concrete is exposed to air. It moves. It's not a big issue. But if you're going to go past that line of passive or occasional into regular water and gallons and gallons, you're going to run into trouble. I'm lost. <laughs> Where are we, dude? Okay. Is it true that new construction is easier to maintain versus old construction? I have a 1950s house, but everything is a pain to restore. Lath and plaster, etc. Maintain. Hmm. It's easier to renovate. I don't know if it's a maintenance question. Like, if it's a 1950s house, it's already gone 70 years. So it is a pain dealing with lath and plaster. Um, but, you know, we really have, we, we, we've, we've compromised longevity for convenience with our building techniques. We've really gone from, like a thousand years ago, they built things to last a thousand years. Okay? 200 years ago, they built things to last 200 years. Now we build things the last 50 to 100. It's, it's, a little, it's a little unnerving. Now, for, for most of the people on the planet, they all think that things are about to go up in a great big fireball anyway, so who cares how long your house lasts, right? <laughs> but, yeah, it's true. Um, I would say that uh, the, the further we get away, along in technology, we're using technology to make things easier and faster and more convenient. We're not necessarily making them better. If that made any sense. So aspects of it, yeah, our technology has made construction better. But sometimes, you know, like at the end of the day, how good is drywall? It's kind of like really not a great product in a lot of weather. <laughs> okay, let's move on. I could just rant about stuff like that all day long. Um, Darius wants to know if I recommend attic foil with holes to keep heat in and stop heat loss in the winter and trap heat in the house in the summer. Wow. Okay, so I'm not exactly familiar with your product, Darius. I'm assuming you... Wow, yeah, that seems really backwards. So in an attic, what we want to do is we want to have fresh air. We want to have enough air going into an attic that we're actually exchanging the air in the attic so that it, as it heats up, it's, it's removed. Okay, so in the winter time, the the air that escapes our in insulation envelope of the building, let's call it a flat, and then you have a, a T, uh, or sorry, an a, a frame roof. So we have insulation barrier. All the all the heat that does eventually escape, okay, it's gone already because it's outside of the insulation barrier. So whether it's in the attic or outside of the attic, it doesn't make a difference. It's already left the insulation barrier, so there's no damage there. Now in the summertime. The heat that gets uh, that, that building up in the attic is from the sun, from the temperature outside. So having fresh air is really important. We don't want to keep any heat in there. I don't know the value of foil. Um, I know that there is a certain value for foil in, in southern climates with a lot of sun for reflecting a certain type of rays from the sun. It's not really my technology. My expertise is not there. I would suggest maybe check out the channel by Matt Risinger. He might have information down there on that because he's from Texas and he's always playing around with the newest technology in building. Um, if you have a particular product you're thinking about, then research them on Google and go through all their technology and all their claims to fame. And then you can make an intelligent decision there. But when it comes down to it, if you're doing it yourself, you got to make your own decision. You're your own best advocate, right? If you're going to be working with a contractor and you guys have a difference of opinion on something, then he's going to be able to back it up with more than I think so, or I've always done it this way. Because there's a lot of guys out there who've done it this way their whole life who do it wrong. So don't take I've always done it this way as an excuse for them being lazy and not doing research. All right. But that's not something that we use in our building up here. So I'm a little unfamiliar. Sorry, I can't help you more than that. Okay. All right. So we got a 12 by 8. Ducks in my basement workshop. 12 by 8. Yeah, okay, that's the trunk. If I hit my head on those, <laughs> one more time, can I replace with smaller round ducting? No. 
No, if you have a 12 by 8, it's because there's a volume of air passing. The only thing you can do with a 12 by 8, all right, is change it to a 24 by 4. So you can go with a much wider, skinnier duct and get more headspace. All right. And changing to round roval ain't going to help you up because it's the, it's the volume. It'll actually make the bottom even lower. <laughs> but you can go with a flatter duct line. They do not have any of that product in the box stores. So you're going to have to go to professional duct supply. And I would probably suggest that you contact somebody in the professional ducting world who can maybe even contract that for you or at least point you in the right direction. If you bring in your current duct size and you go to the supplier, they might on a not busy day take the time to help you um, discuss what the transition is or they might even have a collar for the transition. I'm not exactly sure, but the product does exist. I've seen it installed on a few occasions. I just never have sourced that out myself, so I'm not sure the purchasing situation. But like in Ottawa, we have a place called Boone Plumbing, and they do plumbing and HVAC supply for the commercial side as well. And in commercial applications, you'll see this sometimes. But lots of old houses that have only got seven-foot ceilings have gone to that kind of ducting so that you can have an actual headroom space, right? Because we do have code requirements for 78 inches of clearance in doorways and stuff. And sometimes those ducts have to be made flat and wide in order to accommodate that. So the technology does exist. It is on the shelf. You might be lucky and get a solution that isn't painful at all to do. All right, cheers. Um, what's the proper way to do a water supply stub out? I've already done that question. Phone died. Don't know if it was answered. <laughs> Here's the secret. Um, just go back to the YouTube channel and watch the video again. All right, next question. <laughs> uh, all my basement doors are anywhere from one and a quarter to one and three quarter off the carpeting off the floor. Yeah. Um, wood doors are not solid. Can I add to the bottom of the doors and make it look okay? All right, Scott, you know, here we go. Here's a brilliant question. So you've got carpet in the basement and all your doors have got gaps underneath them of one and a quarter to one and three quarters. The question you need to ask yourself is, when they renovated that basement and all these doors and all these rooms, do you have cold air return in each of those rooms? Okay. If you don't have cold air return in each of those rooms, we have the same issue. You can't push air in if you can't have the air pulled out. So those doors might be cut like in old days. Remember the old houses, the red bricks, the Victorian century homes? They all had something in common. At the bottom of the stairs, right by the front door, there's a great big steel grate. And that was the cold air return. And what those houses used was a cold air return duct in the basement, but the staircase was the cold air system. And every door in every room was cut about an inch and a half to two inches off the floor to allow the air to be pushed out when it was blown into the room. And so that was the negative passive kind of pressure release, the staircase and the gaps under the doors. And as soon as you change that, you, un, you disturb the balance of your heating system. I know kinds of people who remodeled their house and older houses, right? And they didn't have cold air in the bedroom. And so they put in a new door and they got it nice and flush. It looks great. But now they're freezing to death in their bedroom because they can't push heat into a room because the air can't escape. Aha. So think twice about aesthetics over function. All right. You might not like the look, but it might be required because you don't have cold air return. I don't see too many people putting cold air return in every room in a basement. So usually there's only one and it's usually in the mechanical room. And so every door in that basement has got to have gap underneath there to allow for about a four inch round duct worth of cold air pipe. Now, if you flatten that out, it really quickly becomes 30 inches by inch, inch and a half. OK, that's kind of standard. So be careful you don't fix one problem and create another one. Travis, Peyton, Jeff, I'm looking to buy a large log cabin home to live in. Didn't we already go through that? So why are we here? It's the highlight question you got to read. Oh. <laughs> I want, what? We're back at 7 o'clock. Is anybody watching the show anymore, Matt? Yeah, we got 420 people. Okay. Wow. Maybe we can get more current just, with the questions. I just yeah, let's just stay down here in the in the current area. All right? Because the people who are at the beginning of the show might not be here anymore, so I'm not answering them anything. Um, you know, if you want your answer, you gotta you gotta stay watch. 
<laughs> what, what is the preferred sequence for installing trim? Now, listen, folks, if you asked a question a while ago, we're answering questions uh, that have been typed in the last two minutes. So feel free to put your question in again. It's just a lot easier for us to stay current in this chat than to be bouncing all over the place looking for really good questions. Um, it's really not a concern about the quality of the question, right? If it's a question, it needs to be answered because like the last guy was going to change his doors for aesthetics and he might have been wrecking the whole balance of his heating and cooling system. So he could have ended up creating a whole mold environment in his basement just because he wanted his doors to look better. So it's it's potentially, you know, one thing, one question you might think is silly or dumb. It could be really important. All right. So feel free to ask him. Okay, here we go. What is the preferred sequence for installing trim? For example, fastening, caulking, wood putties, blah, 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 blah. All right. The preferred sequence is paint all your trim first. Okay. Now you've got options. You can use adhesive plus a couple of brad nails so you can reduce the amount of holes you got to fill. Right. Um, you want to glue wood trim to wood trim on the, on the miter joints. If you've got to expose fresh wood, touching exposed fresh wood, glue it. Once you're done that, then you cock all of your gaps, right? And then, and then when you're, when you're all done with all that, then you give it one more finished coat of paint. All right. Um, filling the holes and doing a little sanding is necessary. Uh, if you're doing holes, I like using 45 minute drywall compound because it gets done quick in a hurry, but there is a product on the market called DAP and it goes on pink and it dries white. And if you put a little bit more than you need, you can sand it back to flush and then you got to prime it, and then it takes two coats. It's a bit of a pain, but it will work. But it always flashes, so it, it takes a lot of prep work, right? you got to prime it and paint it and paint it. That's why I use the 45, because on a nail hole, 45-minute mud, I sand it. I can hit it with paint one time, and I never see it again, except um, in February, uh, late in the afternoon. But, I, you know, you got to learn how to live with it. <laughs> February late in the afternoon is lousy for everything in the house. Don't ever sell your house February late in the afternoon. People who walk through the house, all they see is disastrous. It's beautiful for the rest of the year. But the way that sun sits so low in the sky, just everything that you've ever done looks like junk. All right. The chicken is asking me. We have, we have a member called the chicken. How cool is that? I have a 100-year-old home and live on a floodplain. It's the only option to protect the basement from water a French drain. Or will a sump pump help too? Okay. Um, your basement needs a sump pump. If you have a French drain, it's going to be going to a sump pump. So a sump pump is part of your solution. Depending on the severity of the situation you're dealing with and your drainage and your soil conditions and all that other kind of jazz, you might find that a sump pump is enough to solve your problem. If it's not and you still have water coming through your walls or over your windowsills, then adding the French drain and putting that waterproof membrane right up to your sill plate is going to be necessary. Only you can answer that question, but you got to start with a sump pump because that's installed so that groundwater that's building up, okay, can be evacuated so that it never puts pressure on your concrete slab and starts cracking and pushing through. So uh, getting that water not in direct contact with your slab is really important for the environment and the air because most likely it's not sealed, right? It doesn't have a vapor barriers tool. So that's what I'm going to suggest. 100-year-old home, it's all about maintenance. It's a cellar. It's not a storage room, okay? And you can maintain that really well. The other suggestion for 100-year-old basements is to spray paint the odorless zinser on the ceiling, floor joists and, and beams, okay? You vapor-proof the entire floor to stop the transfer of high humidity in the basement into the rest of the house. It'll slow down the development of rot in all your floor joist package, and it'll slow down the constant caving in of the floor as well. Um, that's just, that's a cheap way to give you some, some really good protection. So between the two of those things, you should be just fine. Ahmed wants to know to maximize soundproofing in his basement. You mentioned to get rid of ceiling heating. Can I run my ducts in the walls or should I get rid of duct heating altogether? Yeah, that was a video. It was kind of tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> People took me a little too serious on that one. Um, <laughs> depending on what you're doing in your room, right? Like, if you're creating the cone of silence, then you can get rid of the ducts in your room, in the ceiling, and you can go with electric floor heat. And that way you can heat it, but you can't air condition it in the summertime very well. So you got to be real careful. So we got, uh, was that a super chat that I missed there? Yeah, as soon as they pop up, I 
Okay, so we're taking care of that. Next question. Did we? Yep. Yep. Okay. Or, or, or go back to it. I don't think we did. No. It's similar, but not the same. Oh, it just, oh, it just happened. Okay, James. Uh, is it a bad idea to install a vent fan in my roof to evacuate the hot air in the attic during the summer? I have soffits and ridge vents, but would it benefit me to get it out any faster? Ah, brilliant question. Um, generally, the rule is if every other soffit allows fresh air into your attic and you protect it so that it's not filled up with insulation, then you have enough air, okay? If, if you have that and you have a ridge vent, you have enough air transfer there that you're exchanging it you should be just fine. I don't think investing in any more is really a big concern. Um, one thing you might want to do is check your soffit and make sure that they're all drilled out. I don't know how old your house is, or but if you were to, uh, if you had a way to check, if you take off your 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 um, your fascia, no, sorry, take off your soffit, your aluminum, and have a look. And see, is it open? Is it um, is it uh, is it a little trough? And it's got the mesh stapled on there. Um, is it behind the soffit? When you take off your aluminum cover, are there three holes drilled in, in a solid wood? And the next piece doesn't have holes. And if that's the case, then make sure all of your soffits have holes drilled into them. It clearly depends on the age of the home. Honestly, if you became a member, you'd be able to send me pictures of what you're dealing with, and I could advise you better. But Here's the deal. The heat in the attic really only relates to the lifespan of your shingle. It's really the only thing that's affected. So you have good ventilation. To have better ventilation means you don't change your shingles as often. So if you buy a new 50-year architectural shingle on the market and you're in the south and you got a lot of heat, you're only going to get 25 years out of it. Understand that you're buying a 25-year roof. Okay. If you switch over to metal, you can get 50, but it's twice as expensive. So right? You're kind of six of one half dozen the other. If you identify the fact that you've got poor circulation and you, you, you don't have enough soffit ventilation going on and you could improve it, you might say, well, you listen, I'm changing my roof every 15 years. Well, then that's a sure sign that you don't have good ventilation, but only if you've got a good quality shingle <laughs> again. So there is some, uh, there are some guys out there who can actually come and test and take the temperature reading in your attic. And there are charts out there that'll tell you um, at what point you're gone too far. So feel free to go and do that kind of research. But the, to take anecdotal evidence going, wow, it's really hot up here. Maybe we should put in some more ventilation might not be the best plan. All right. Ace wants to know, should I insulate my ducting if I insulated the crawl space too? I'm in Seattle. I got bubble wrap, but I have to do an air barrier with, which seems like a pain. Okay, so you've got a crawl space, and you've insulated the crawl space. And then you've got a heat duct running to a room in that extension of the house. And you want to know, should I insulate that heat duct? No, the answer is you should be adding heat to the crawl space. Treat it like a room have heat on one side and a cold air return on the other. So you're actually exchanging the air in that space. All right. If you have any failure in that system and you're, you're exchanging air, it keeps it dry first of all, but it'll keep it warm so that your other pipe isn't freezing up. Right. You, if you run hot air through a cold room, you're going to have a problem. Insulating it isn't the solution because if it's too cold that your hot air is getting cold, that means a, you maybe you don't have enough insulation. But insulation only works with a heat source. So you got to blow in hot air. And if you blow in hot air, then you're also making the floor warm and it kills the draft in that room and it'll make everything a lot more environmentally friendly. But all the heat that's in that room is going to, it's going to rise because you're insulated. So you, your, your, your crawl space and your living space, that's one space separated by a floor, but the heat passes through it, okay? And so heat is a lot, lot more... Um, uh, it, it wants to rise more than it wants to go out the insulated wall. Okay. So it's going to pass through the floor and then eventually end up in the other room anyway. So it becomes part of the warming system of that room. And you're going to find it's a massive benefit to keep that crawl space heated. Even if it's not incredible amount of heat, it'll be a lot more comfortable and it'll provide the kind of heat in the room that you need it to a lot more efficiently. Okay. 
Wow. Timothy says, smash the like button. Huh? Ken, if you like. I've got no, no problem if you want to smash the like button. You know, um, just real quick. I mean, we've had a lot of really good success on YouTube the last couple of years, uh, largely because you guys keep supporting us. Uh, and so thank you. It's been awesome. Um, ways you can help support our channel, of course, is hitting the like button. But more importantly, is subscribing to the channel. And a lot of you guys haven't subscribed yet, but you watch the videos all the time. And I get it, right? Like, who wants to be a joiner? But uh, it's a clear signal to YouTube that our fan base appreciates us. So feel free to jump in and do that. It would be awesome. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can go to our website, check out our affiliates. There's a lot of things happening this year that I can't share with you yet. I'm really excited about the future this year. But uh, check out our affiliates and use our Amazon links. I know we have a we have Amazon links for the United States, Canada, and Great Britain now. But you got to go to our web page because all these things that link back and forth they have limitations and restrictions, and we can't put them all direct on our YouTube video. So if you're in Canada or you or Great Britain, you can definitely support us with your Amazon purchases. Just go to our um, homepage. Uh, homerenovisiondiy.com and go to shop with us. And the first thing on there is three flags. Just pick your flag and that's a link to go shop at Amazon. Okay. And you can even star that and save that on your browser. So it's really quick and easy. And you can, uh, you can show, show us a little love by supporting us. And, and if you don't want to support us, that's fine. But find somebody that you can support. I mean, Amazon is giving that money away to somebody sooner or later. So feel free to support us by or, or support somebody. Pick your favorite YouTuber and support them by doing that, okay? Oh, all right, Ace. Wow, that's a lot of love, buddy. <laughs> You've been watching me for years. Right on. Saved them tens of thousands. You know what? And, and that is the whole damn point, isn't it? Like, really? That's the whole damn point. Um, there's just no reason why, with all of the technology that's out there and all the tools that are out there, and all the availability to information that you guys can't renovate yourself and save a ton of money. Remember, half the money you spend on a contractor goes to the government one way or another. Right? 25 to 30% of what you give to a contractor goes in his wallet for labor and all the guys that he hires. Nine times out of 10, the people that he hires are not any smarter than you. So you're your own best contractor. Right? Figure it out. <laughs> All right, Mark from Quebec. And cheers for that. I appreciate that. My goodness. Mark from Quebec here. Love the live chats. Can I use an underlayment with vinyl flooring or do I have to use a special one made for that? Okay, Mark, I know what you're talking about. Different companies have got different requirements, right? Everybody's got their warranty. Ooh, here's our specifications for warranty. So uh, last year, Home Depot had life proof flooring. You're not allowed to use an underpad. No warranty if you break the law. Rawr. And it was just like, who do you think you are? Like, you're going to say no underpad with your product because you haven't taken the time to research what the best way to install your product is? <laughs> like, that's just ignorant. Um, sure enough, they, everybody, I, I'd say go get an underpad for life proof if you're going to use it. You need it. You need the sound deadening. Or otherwise, it's just a really poor install and you're going to be unhappy. You need to, you need to be able to sub, sub, separate the floor from the plywood in case there's dirt or chunks or because it doesn't translate. Oh, but, and they ran into all kinds of problems because they didn't take my advice. So now what, is that, what do they got? LifeProof now has a recommended underlay. I'm telling you right now, if you make your decisions based on what the box store's products are and their warranty claims, you're really ill-informed, all right? Let's put some value on the warranties, first of all, all right? If a company like LifeProof says, here's a warranty on this floor, don't use an underlay. And so use your wildest imagination. You get a flood. Is your floor warrantied? No, there's no warranty if you flood. Even though it's waterproof, there's no warranty. If your house catches on fire, no warranty. Um, your kid plays with a chainsaw, no warranty. What? on earth could possibly be the scenario that you have a warranty claim against life proof flooring that the presence or no presence of the underlay could possibly affect it. And the only thing is, is the joint going to separate, right? That's the only thing you could, 
And I'm telling you right now, you can take a hammer to two planks on a good underlay. You'll never separate that joint. A good quality underlay is a very dense foam, all right? It's not very thick, and it's very dense. And if anybody out there is like, well, we can't do it, not, we got, can't have an underlay, I'm telling you right now, take that thing in and throw it in the garbage. Go and try it yourself. Go get yourself a little piece of underlay, grab some flooring, and see what effort it takes to split that apart. Watch that video that I did where I showed the demonstration of uh, the best vinyl floors on the market. I wasn't trying to say that the one I got from the corner is the best. I'm trying to say that there's a certain type of quality out there that's not being delivered in the box stores. All right. And that was the point of the video. I don't care where you buy your vinyl floor. You can support us by shopping through our affiliates or you can buy something local, get it faster and maybe even cheaper. The point is make sure you're buying good quality. Don't pay for crap that you're not getting any benefit from just because it's the most expensive thing in the box, right? I'm going to come up with this new slogan, Matthew. You ready for this? Think outside the box store. <laughs> right? Like, can we all just stop and go, there's a hundred options for everything on that shelf that other people are selling. And maybe, just maybe, I'm being ripped off by not being educated. Just saying. I'm ranting again, but, oh, God, it drives me nuts. Whoo! Okay. Sometimes I feel like Jesus driving all the money changers out of the temple, right? Okay. Um, well, there's a reference and you're not going to hear every day. All right. <laughs> oh, uh, we have the element penguin. The, this is so creative. You guys are going to have to come up with some of the craziest names. So when I do my live show, I just start slaying myself in laughter. How should I join two parts of baseboard trim along a wall at a 45 or a 90? Hmm. First question you're going to ask yourself is how good is your saw? Right. And how good is your wall? Um, because when you put two pieces of wood cut 90 against each other and you push against the wall, if you, if you test it first, right, is it flush? There's your answer. Uh, all walls have comings and goings and moving. And so the wood is coming different directions. You're going to find that if you go into 45 or even a 22 and a half, it doesn't have to be 45. It, it gives you the little bit of room so that you can, you can pull them apart if there's discrepancies, just a hair. And then you can use filler and sand it clean. Okay. Generally speaking, it's more effective. But depending on the quality of carpentry you're doing, I would say that the majority of new home construction is going in butt joint with glue. All right. And that works fine. If you butt joint it and glue it and you just sand that joint after the glue was dried up, you're going to have a nice smooth transition. No one's ever going to see it. Seven minutes. Seven minutes to go. All right. Matt's got me on a timer here. I got to finish a quarter after eight. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we still got 400 people watching. So there's only 296 thumbs up. There's 400 people watching. All right. Challenge. If you're watching this video right now, hit the thumbs up button. Like that is just wrong. Yeah. 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 Hit it. Smash it. Bam, 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 bam. All right. Um, John. Hey, Jeff. I have a metal lifetime roof. Okay. Good for you. Bet it's not going to last a lifetime. Um, unless you're really old. Snow never piles up more than one inch. Okay. How can I protect doorways from clearing right on someone's head? Oh, well, dude, yeah. John, they got some great technology out there. Um, it's for the, the slide, right? So they've got little brackets, and they screw to the roof. And if it's not enough, you can even add a thin rail. Okay. Um, the other thing you can do is you put an eaves trough and uh, – just drop in a heating cable right there at the end, and it'll just melt it all and drain it away. So there's a couple options. But if you contact the guys that installed your roof, like honestly, they should have tried to upsell you on that already, right? But there's just snow breaks. And what it does is it just, it keeps it from sliding down. It'll bunch up, it'll melt, it'll drip and all that. And it's always inconvenient, right? And so if, you're, if your snow isn't gathering, and it's metal, then the sun, depending on the temperature where you live, can really make it just rain all the time on you. Get an eaves trough and solve that up. Kaylin, we have a Schluter pan with hardy backer walls with red guard. Is it better for a double two by four curb or should we order a Schluter curb? Love the videos. Ah, okay. Kaylin, experience talking. Are you ready for this? Buy the Schluter curb. 
I don't care what kind of wood you introduce to your shower area, okay? It is more prone to swell for a lot of different reasons and then create cracks in your waterproofing system, okay? Even from, even from leaks from a sink next to the curb getting underneath your tile. Listen to me carefully. Do not play around with anything that can expand and contract when it comes to your waterproofing system. Use only materials that will not expand and contract as a part of a waterproofing system. End the discussion. I'm doing install right now. Yeah, good. Yeah. Order the damn curb. Um, if, if, and if it takes too long to get it, if you've got a floor and decor in your area, you can get it from them. And if they don't, you can do your Google search for your floor and supplies um, wholesaler. And different wholesalers are Schluter distributors. Some tile companies are Schluter distributors. They might have it in stock or they can get it really quick for you. Um, but yeah, don't, don't move forward without it. Okay. Even if you got to take a whole week off the project, trust me on this. Last thing you want to do is introduce something that can expand, cause cracks, make a leak, and then all of that investment, all that energy for nothing. So don't do it. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> part of the Jeff unfiltered. Bum, bum, bum. All right. Think outside the box store. Can I place the electrical and plumbing outlets for my refrigerator? Okay, hold on. Let me slow down. I got to think here now. Can I place the electrical and plumbing for my refrigerator inside an old unused chimney as long as it has substrate to be attached to? Okay. So first of all, plumbing and electrical. Um, really, the only thing you got to do with plumbing is make sure that you're not subjecting it to freezing temperatures. And you want to keep it from um, uh, moving around. If it's copper, you don't want it vibrating, so you need clips. All right? Electrical needs to be uh, attached to something every five feet or so, according to code. So, but you can use a chimney as a chase, and it's completely acceptable to staple it at each end as it comes in and out. I can't see that being a problem. Um, not sure. Refrigerator inside an old chimney. Okay, yeah. I mean, it just becomes like a great big conduit pipe, really, is what happens. So I can't see that being a problem. The only issue I might have is chimneys and stone. Stone's very abrasive. And so make sure that your, your, your lines aren't, like, um, tight on the edge. Because there's always going to be movement and vibration. And that's just a fact of life. Things have, like, a, a, a frequency. They're always moving. When, when water and electrical is moving, there's always vibration. And so you could end up cutting through the lines, which is something you want to be careful of. So if you're going in and out of a chimney, uh, maybe something as simple as just um, uh, putting a piece of unused underpad at the edge and, and taping it on or something, okay? But be careful with that. Have you ever done a video of basic tools everyone should have? Yes, I did. Uh, it's in the tool library of our live videos. They're power tools, so I haven't done hand tools yet, but we should get to that. Matt, write that one down. It's definitely time for some basic hand tools kind of, yeah, love that idea. Thank you for that. Cheers. Well, that's so rude of me to say cheers and not have a sip. Okay, where are we? Whatever happened to the house fire walkthrough video? Oh, litigation. We had to take it down. Yeah, the, you know, the people that had the fire we just weren't keen about having that video up, so we took it down. It's a, uh, that's, that's, that's too bad. Uh, if any note to anybody who lives in the Ottawa area, if your house burns to the ground, please call me. I'd love to come by and film. There's a lot we can learn from something like that. Um, it's kind of like giving your body away to science after you're dead. But I mean, seriously, uh, I, I would jump at the opportunity to film an actual post disaster event. So leave that in the back of your mind and do with it what you want. All right. Uh, is that good? Are we there? 1920s home has no sheathing. Only the studs are connected to the wood siding. Okay, I'm at the stage of adding insulation. I'm in zone three. Oh, man. Zone three. Is, is one south and then it's going north? So one is like Miami. Two is the rest of Florida. Three is like Georgia, I'm thinking. Okay, so, um, so Deborah, if I have that right, <laughs> I'm a little tired. Matt, slide back up there so I can read through that question a little bit more. Whoa, I'm getting vertigo. Okay, so you got no sheathing. Yeah, the, the, the siding on that house is probably going to be in two layers, I'm guessing. 
There's going to be a first layer siding and then a second layer siding. That's very standard. 1920s, they might have been cheating. There might only be one layer of siding. It is also the sheathing, okay? That siding was actually installed to add stability so things didn't twist it, okay? So that's what it's doing. Matt, please, where's the question? Leave it there. Thank you. Um, and and blah, blah, blah. Can I, what siding? Adding some other there. Okay, what kind of insulation should you get? Zone three insulation should be like fiberglass with like a paper backing on it, all right? But you do have to be very careful installing it because it's very easy to leave gaps, okay? So, um, but that's what you need. You don't need a vapor barrier in zone three, if I'm right about zone three being around Georgia, all right? Think of it this way. The way you answer this question is with vapor barrier, you don't need it until you go far enough north that you have heat on more time during the year than air conditioning. That's kind of the basic answer to the question, okay? And well, there's going to be building code rules in different zones and different cities and states. So really pay attention to that. Maybe do a quick Google search, but you know what we should have here, Matt? I would love to have a, a chart on the wall with like all the different zones on it. Just for reference to help deal with these questions. That's, that'd be a great, that'd be a great tool for me. All right. Um, okay. So yeah, Tina is going, Tina Michelle says, I got to go to Florida and decor again. They're going to be putting new flooring in the house. Uh, cheap laminate floating floors. Yeah, right? 12 years old. That's just, that's not fair. There is really good quality floors that will last 30 to 50 years out there for the same price as laminate if you spend an extra buck a square foot. So don't buy the 10 to 12 year stuff, folks. Um, you know, last time we were down in Florida, and I think I'm going to end it with questions there. Yeah. No more questions. Almost 400 likes. Yeah, come on, guys. We can do more than that. We need six more. Give me six more likes. We'll go over 400. I'll tell you a story. So we were in, down in Florida and we stayed there last year for a couple months, which was like the most amazing break we've ever had. And I love the hospitality of Floridians. Guys are awesome. And for a guy like me going down there and not wearing a parka. Wow. How cool was that? There we go. See, all I gotta do is ask, Matt. All right. So give me 10 more, that 10 more likes. Time, <laughs> I love it. All right. So we're down there in Florida and we rented this place out. It was a beautiful facility. It had a great layout. It was two stories. It was like um, literally six houses on a sandy walkway to the beach. It was beautiful. These folks renovated that house, did a great job with the decoration, the decor, the layout, but they used laminate floor everywhere. And all of the cabinetry, the kitchens, the bathroom, everything was installed on top of this laminate floor. And I'm just... I'm looking at this. I'm like, this is only two years old. I knew. And I could already see all the damage around the doors, the gaps, the cupping, the problems, the sagging, the, the, the discoloration in the bathroom, because right up to the shower door. <laughs> and I'm like, why in God's green earth are people installing a flooring that's guaranteed to have to be ripped out within five to 10 years? And your whole kitchen, all your bathrooms are installed on top of it. Blew my mind. Somebody needed a show like this back in the day that they made those plans because they just bought the wrong stuff. It was pretty, but really, you don't use pretty wallpaper on a floor either for obvious reasons. So anyway, we need to insert a commercial so Jeff can get a new drink. <laughs> was that you, Matt? <laughs> that must be Michelle chiming in. All right. Um, no, 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 no. I'm done. I got to drive home soon. Well, one with you're not driving me home. I'm a big boy. All right, so let's go down to the very bottom, guys. So that's it for me today. Uh, lots of love, and uh, thanks for joining us. We're gonna do this again next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, we will answer everybody's questions. Um, awesome to hang out with the members tonight. I hope we got to everybody. If we didn't answer your question today, then please jump into the forum. It's actually working now. My apologies for all of the hiccups. Um, cheers to all of you for joining us tonight. It was a blast and appreciate your patience while we worked out our technical difficulties. All right. We will see you soon. And until then, stay safe and take care of each other. Cheers. Ah. Finito.